this life, it's a terminal diagnosis. Nobody gets out of here alive. And so the only thing that you can do is live truth. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Claire. Welcome back, my Liberty lobbyists, to another edition of the Lions of Liberty podcast, your home for great conversations about these ideas of liberty. This is the 259th episode of this program, which means that you can find today's show notes featuring links to everything we discuss over at lionsofliberty.com slash 259. And I know many of you out there are facing major healthcare decisions, especially right now with the open enrollment period for 2017 having just begun. I want to encourage you to check out today's sponsors, Health Excellence Select. They have set up the ultimate free market, affordable alternative to Obamacare that you absolutely must check out. Learn more at lionsofliberty.com slash health. My guest today is a libertarian candidate for U.S. Senate out of the fine state of Indiana. She currently serves as the secretary of the Hamilton County Libertarian Party. I am pleased to welcome Miss Lucy Brenton. Lucy, are you ready to roar? roar. Well, that was more of like a Halloween roar than a lion roar. It, it, it got vis- me jumping out of my seat. So, <laughs> But the, the visual I'm trying to get, if you've ever seen that meme where they've got the real cute little kitty cat looking into the mirror and the cat sees the lion, that's, that's what I'm trying to... Uh, to convey right there. This must be a theme with you, you Indiana people, because my, my buddy Chris Spangle, uh, he, he's a big cat meme guy too. All, all these Indiana libertarians, you're obsessed with the cats and the cat memes. Oh no. So probably Chris Spangle, all he did was talk about mittens, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know Chris. I don't know buddy. what Chris is talking about half the time, but I know you guys are familiar with each other. <laughs> we are. Yes, we are. So uh, why don't we just get started? Uh, obviously, you're, you're currently a candidate for Senate. Uh, I've interviewed a few other candidates for Senate. Uh, Mr. Arvin Vora, most yes. recently, also Lily Tang Williams. So there's a lot of great libertarians currently running for this specific office. And we'll get into more about the specifics of your Senate run in a minute. But I want to first learn a little bit more about yourself and, and how you became interested in the ideas of liberty. So why don't you detail a little bit about you know where you grew up and uh, how you first became familiar with this crazy thing we call libertarianism? Oh, thanks so much. I grew up a very rebellious Mormon and met a man that would protect me in my rebelliousness. So I left the Mormon church. And so my whole uh, my whole life has been investigation and correlating that research, trying to determine, um, you know, what really is the truth. And that was the problem with Mormonism is that they worshiped many gods. Every god had a father who's a god who had a father who's god. And I was like, hey, wait, uh, you know, cut this crap. I want to worship the number one god. And so that research actually led me out of the Mormon church when I met my husband and I was. That's husband. really interesting. Can we just pause there for a minute? Because yeah. I, I, I don't think I've interviewed anyone that's actually left the Mormon church. I know it's it's frowned upon <laughs> to, to leave the church <laughs> by, by other Mormons, to, to put it lightly. So what was that like for you? Did that cause uh, any problems within your family? Did they really want you to stay? I mean, how, how did that play out? Oh, gosh, it's awful because my mom was from Salt Lake City, Utah, and like she could trace her lineage all the way back to the founders of the church who crossed from the Midwest to oh, wow. Utah. So I'm an apostate. I'm the third cousin of the 13th prophet of the church who was Ezra Taft Benson and actually served as secretary of agriculture for President Johnson. Wow. So yeah, so actually I was scared because most people don't know, but in Mormonism, and this is why I left, there's this concept called blood atonement. And it said that Jesus's blood does not atone for serious sins. Quite the opposite, obviously, of, of traditional Christianity. Yeah, that's not but, at all what I've been hearing about Jesus. No, no. And if you and if you, if you want your uh, if you want your sins to be redeemed, and you've done one of these serious sins like you know adultery or murder, your own blood must be spilled. So when people leave the church, like back in the 1800s, especially, they would be hunted down and killed. And that actually one of the reasons when I fell in love with my husband, really? you know, I was like, oh, this is so good because he's you know a big football type, real smart guy. But <laughs> right. he, He's built like a linebacker, and I knew if the Mormons ever came after me, he'd totally be able to just smoke him. No Mormons are messing with your your man, huh? No, they're not messing with me either because of my man. I never, I had never heard that before. I never knew that people used to get literally lynched for for leaving their. They they had a whole secret police called the Day Knights, and that was their entire job. Wow. That is fascinating. Yeah. It's almost like it, it kind of sounds like Scientology. Scientologists don't actually lynch people, but they do try to sort of lynch people and, and smear their names in, in that sort of way. They do. They're they're pretty similar. So I'm an escapee. And when I fell into the truth, 
because of all of my research, I was like, okay, so there are ways that you can logically look at things, right? You can look at third party sources, you can see what's in common and the things that are in common are generally the truth. And I'm a reader, so I'd actually read the Constitution and many of the other founding documents, you know, read some of the Federalist Papers and Anti-Federalist Papers by that age. And when I looked around, I just saw such inconsistency between what I saw in our culture versus what the founding documents were supposed to be. And I realized that I really like those founding documents better. And luckily, I grew up in a pro-Second Amendment household. <laughs> and we had guns everywhere. So it was, um, it was not a big stretch for me to be a libertarian. So was it, it that that kind of attitude, your your quest for truth over just believing whatever you're told or believing whatever dogma is, is sent your way, that seems to be kind of the same attitude that eventually led you to to the ideas of liberty. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one of the things that I realized as I was researching religion is that not only was my soul my own, and it was a gift from my creator, but I'm the only one responsible for my soul. So if other people had tell, had told me lies, yeah, they're wrong for telling me lies, but it's also wrong for me to just simply blindly accept them. So if I'm the one that's responsible for my soul, I would better make sure that I do the right thing and rely upon my own research and not just hearsay. So what I like to tell people is that I stopped eating their carrots and I broke their damn stick. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting because people come to the ideas of liberty in, in a lot of different ways. But to me, this this kind of sounds like a, a part of your overall philosophy. Uh, when you say there, you you are your your soul. You're a unique soul, and and you are it is your own. You own it yes. essentially, or you are the same as it. And that really is the same idea of libertarianism. The, the concept of of body ownership, of owning your own body, and to you, owning your own soul is maybe just a, a sort of a metaphysical kind of manifestation of that. Exactly. As above, so below. But it's funny because when Romney was running, Romney being a Mormon, there was this, there are all these urban myths that ran through the Mormon religion. And one of them is that someday, someday the constitution would be hanging by a thread and the elders of the church would step forward and save the country. So literally Mormons all over the country and all over the world thought that Romney was going to be the fulfillment of that prophecy. And then he didn't even get in because he's milk toast white liberal. Man, you, you're you're scaring me about these Mormons more than I ever was before. <laughs> they're sweet. They're sweet people. Well, I they're actually just, just spent nice. about three weeks as listeners of this program. Now I spent three weeks uh, holed up in Provo, Utah. So I, I'm pretty familiar with with uh, the Mormons. And um, you're right; they're very sweet. Love them. I, it was stop. a great, cult- yeah, great, great culture to live up to grow up in, but uh, not one that I would continue in. It's only when you start hearing stuff about secret police and about Mitt Romney being the Messiah that you start to, you know, look at things a little, little askew. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know my Messiah was going to be working for Bain Capital. Uh, <laughs> was that in the original prophecy? I'm not sure. Uh, they added it later to make it look legit. They do that a lot. Change the doc. Right, right. Uh, so, Lucy, how did you, you take this, these, these kind of revelations and this, this sort of spiritual rev- revelation that you had about your soul, about your individualism, and that brought you to the ideas of liberty? So how did you take that and turn that into political activism? Obviously, you've been active with the Libertarian Party in Indiana. What made you take that extra step and say, I don't want to just sit around believing these things. I want to go out there and, and try to actually create some political change. Oh, thanks for asking. It was it's really interesting. From the very beginning, I was operating from a place of fear. You know, I was afraid that the Mormons could get me. I was afraid these people could get me. And then after my husband and I started dating shortly after we were married, we're having this discussion. He's basically calling me out for being the kinds of things that Trump grabs. You know, I just wasn't being very um, courageous. And he said, look, he said, if there's a barrier, I'm going to bust it down. I'm going to go over it, around it, under it, blow it up if I have to. He said, but I'm not going to let any barrier stop me. And I was like, whoa, that's really profound. So I adopted that because as my husband and I have discussed before, this life, it's a terminal, it's a terminal diagnosis. Nobody gets out of here alive. And so the only thing that you can do is live truth. And that's it. Because anything less than that obviously doesn't honor yourself, your person, your soul, whatever, but it also doesn't do the rest of us any good. And so you just have to step out on faith, courage, whatever you want to call it, chutz paw. And just do the right thing, regardless of the consequences. Well, chutzpah, that's the word I'm familiar with because I, I grew up in a, uh, a Jewish household. So ah, I, I know what that one means. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> 
And so it would, did you really see the Libertarian Party as as that's the vehicle you looked at right away? Because a lot of Liberty folks, they go in a lot of different directions. A lot of people reject the, the party system altogether. Some people think they should work within the Republican Party since it's it's sort of the major party. And there are at least some sort of inklings of references to the ideas of freedom very vaguely. So what, why did you kind of make a beeline to the Libertarian Party? Oh, that's funny. My mother, believe it or not, it was network marketing, MLM. That, that really caused a lot of my growth because one of her business partners, one of my mom's business partners, they started a multi-level marketing company. And one of her business partners was so cool. She had her PhD in clinical nutrition. She had all these books. She let me have access to her library. So when I was 13, I first read a book on vaccines. That was revelatory. The next book that I read was called The Unseen Hand by A. Ralph Epperson. And if anyone has not read The Unseen Hand, I highly recommend it because that like parted the sea for me. And I was able to see past the government BS. And that's when I learned that Abraham Lincoln had thrown my Indiana senators in jail and suspended the writ of habeas corpus and that the Civil War was not always about slavery. You know, that was more of an excuse. It was really about states' rights and the fact that the the South wanted its right to secede from the Union and the North was going to keep them at any cost. And so that was my evolution was, you know, reading the books and of course, there's Ayn Rand in there too. I mean, who hasn't read The Fountainhead? And she Atlas always book. she always sneaks her way into these things. Oh my gosh, there's one book of hers I bought and I've not finished it. I'm ashamed to admit. It's called The Objectivist Philosophy. Man, it'll make your head hurt trying to read this book. It is really, really deep. But maybe someday I'll finish it. All right. And so, how long have you been involved with with the Libertarian Party in in, in, in Indiana? Have you guys made any kind of uh, major headways into p- the political? Uh, uh, conversation out there in Indiana, or are you still kind of shunted to the side as, as, as those annoying libertarians? Yeah, it's really a mixed bag. I first ran for office back in 95 as city county council and was very blessed because it was a small geographical area. And we had a ton of libertarians show up to walk for me. I got like 12% of the vote, which was the most any libertarian had gotten around here up to that point. So that was really awesome. But my husband and I have 10 children now. Back in 95, we only had two. So it was, you know, it was easy for me to run when there were two kids. And then as I got more and more and more children, you know, we just didn't have time. But now the baby's three years old. And I was like, yeah, I got 10 kids, but that's really not an excuse to to fail to do something. And so I went ahead and jumped back in. The political climate here is really pretty libertarian friendly because we're in a mostly Republican state. I do get, you know, the general hate with the wasted vote script, you know, that the old parties have put into them. And I'm not getting the press that I deserve. In my race, I'm actually running against uh, former Governor Evan Bayh, who spent eight years as a governor in Indiana and two terms, 12 years as a senator. And the Republican that I'm running against has been in the House of Representatives for three terms. This is his sixth year. They've spent $8 million on the race so far. And I'm pulling votes from both of them. So whether I pull vote, more votes from Bai or more votes from Young, I'm the one that's actually deciding this race. So they try to ignore me. They try to ignore you, but they can't. If you know that you're pulling from both of them, they can't really ignore ignore the issues you're talking about in that case. Is that is that what you see as your role in this election? Or, or do you think you have the ability here in the next few weeks to actually gain some traction and actually compete for that, for that Senate seat? Uh, that's a great question. I, I really do think that I have a chance to win. I know for sure that I will have more votes per dollar spent than either of them. But that's a pretty easy contest to win. The biggest thing sure, they're just they're just blowing it all on on, on consultants and then, you know, all these political strategy guys who are making who knows an hour to uh, to do what they do. Oh, yeah. And you should see the commercials. It's amazing. But I'll tell you what next for me, it's next Tuesday. It's October 18th at 7 p.m. So if your listeners are hearing this after that, go to Indiana Debate Commission.org. It truly is a nonpartisan nonprofit that wants people to have all of the choices. So I will be aired live on television screens across Indiana on Tuesday night as I debate both Bai and Young. And I am so pleased to be the libertarian because each of them have to focus on first attacking each other because they got to whittle that one or two percent. They're literally running like 40 and 42 percent right now. And then I've got the other. 5% to 20%, depending upon which poll actually names me or not, or they just put me down as the undecided. And so they'll be attacking each other, trying to whittle that away. I, however, have a very different agenda. And my agenda is to represent the truth and to advance the cause of liberty and show people, holy crap, there's a third choice. You mean I don't have to vote for Tweedledee or Tweedledummer? <laughs> they also have uh, Tweedle Lucy. 
as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it's I love Lucy. That's what I. That's what I'm hoping people will do. I'm hoping oh, they'll go. be so confused. They're going to be in the. This is like my vision, right? So they're going to be in the ballot. They're going to be, you know, there with that ballot in front of them, going young by asshole. Am I allowed to say it on your show? Sure. sure. Say whatever you jerk. want. <laughs> okay. I didn't know, you know, the rules on this I'm one. I'm not going to hold okay. you back. We're here to roar, not to pussyfoot around things. Well, thank you. Absolutely. So they're going to look at Lucy and they're going to say, I love Lucy. I'm voting for her. And they're going to put me down, not only because I'm female, but because my name is Lucy and because I'm not the other two guys. And I'm fine with all of those reasons, but I really hope they see me at the live debate that's televised and go, holy crap. How is this possible that we didn't know who she was? Well, the, the fact that you are able to debate is, is certainly a huge step. And that's I think that's yes. that is really the number one thing that keeps libertarians, but third parties in general, just off the radar, because most people aren't as tuned into politics as us liberty nerds are or, or other political junkies might be. And they really only often kind of tune into things a few weeks before the election. So they'll turn on the TV, they'll see the news talk about who's running, they'll see a debate, and they'll look at that debate and they'll say, oh, okay, uh, I guess I got to vote for one of these guys. And if you're not in that debate, then you don't exist. It's been Gary Johnson's argument this whole time uh, that I, if, if he's not in the debates, people aren't going to take him seriously. And and sadly, that's true. We're, we're It's actually amazing that he can even be polling at, at, at any number at all. He's probably polling higher than a libertarian presidential candidate has, has ever polled. Uh, and that's without being in the debates. So that, that shows you how how discontented people are with, with the main parties nowadays. They're actually going out of their way to to seek alternatives. So you can't even imagine the world we'd live in if they actually treated third parties fairly and, and consistently led us into the debates. Oh, it's insane. You're absolutely right. And I've got a huge opportunity. And this debate commission here in Indiana is so straightforward. And it's, you know, they're multipartisan in there. It really is a good commission. You can even go back and view the prior two senatorial elections and see my predecessors who did a very, very good job. And we've had two gubernatorial debates where our libertarian candidate was included. His name is Rex Bell, and he's done an amazing job, just a consistent voice for liberty. Every time the other guys propose some new spending scheme, he's like, guys, it's, you know, it's not something we can do. It's not something we should do. Government shouldn't be doing this. So it's, it's really great that now people are going to be uh, hit from all sides with the voice of liberty. It does seem like uh, you libertarian folks out there in Indiana, the LP guys, they they are pretty on top of the ball because you, got, you guys you seem to be making uh, more headway into into politics there. Even just the fact that you're able to get into to these debates and have that voice and be taken somewhat seriously as a candidate that that needs to be at least listened to. That these other two guys need to at least like talk about the issues you're talking about. So, what do you attribute the the relative success I think you guys have had out there in Indiana as opposed yes. to some other states where the libertarian they may as well not exist. Uh, it has it has nothing to do with me personally, other than the fact that throughout the years I've worked with you know other libertarians. Our party leadership is very good. We've been extremely consistent and dogged, and over the years, just over and over and over again, we've managed to convince people that hey, come along with us, volunteer with us. Our ballot access might be a little bit easier than it is in some states. For us, our ballot access is tied to our Secretary of State's race. So as long as we can get at least 2% in the Secretary of State race, then we're able to continue our ballot access. And that's very superior to places like Oklahoma, where they basically have to spend 100 grand in order to get ballot access, you know, or spend hundreds of thousands of dollars collecting signatures. So it wasn't always that way. But once we got to that 2% the first time, we didn't have to do the, um, the ballots or the, uh, you know, the, you know, what I'm talking about the signatures to hit that mark to, to guarantee ballot oh, access. Right? Am- yes, exactly. It was, it was amazing. The petitions. Yeah. Once we got to dispense with the petitions, it was a much easier life. Lucy, in just a minute, I want to dive into uh, some of the specific issues that you're campaigning on, that you're talking about out there on the campaign trail. But first I need to take a quick minute to tell our listeners about today's sponsors, the fine folks at health excellence select. Now, I'm a freelancer and I purchased my own health insurance and I was hit by some serious sticker shock after the implementation of Obamacare. My premiums and deductibles were skyrocketing. And as someone who keeps myself pretty healthy, I knew that I was getting a raw deal for a product I simply didn't want. This caused me to seek an alternative and I found an amazing alternative in the form of health sharing, a killer concept where healthy individuals agree to share their medical costs. That's right. It's a voluntary free market system for paying for your health care that also, thanks to an exemption, covers the Obamacare mandate. 
Our friends at Health Excellence Select have kicked it up a notch by creating a full service package to handle all of your health care needs. Trust me, I'm not just a proponent of health sharing. I'm also a client. This has been one of the greatest things I've ever done to leave the Obamacare system in favor of what our friends at Health Excellence Select are doing. To learn more, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. And don't hesitate to give my man Jeff Cantor a call at 440-283-6849. Be sure to mention Lions of Liberty. All right, Lucy. Well, you're running for office. You're running for Senate. So it seems logical for us to uh, check out your campaign platform a little bit and see what you, some of your positions are. Because while libertarians agree on a wide swath of issues, we don't always agree on the minutia. So why don't we break a couple issues down and see see what we got going on here. And, and I'm not going to start it with an easy one at all because I've done a lot of interviews in the days and I, I don't feel like doing the easy stuff anymore. So <laughs> I'll take it all. You get, we're going to start head on. So why don't I just ask you, uh, what is your position on abortion? On abortion? Well, I'm a woman that has 10 children. So I think most people look at me and say, yep, she's pro-life and they would be right. <laughs> they just got to look at one, one picture of your family and they know. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, she's, she's probably pro-life. And that is true. My personal position on it obviously is pro-life, but the really awesome thing about being a libertarian is I can have a personal position and a political position. They can differ. So politically, I have to look as a, as a senatorial candidate at the federal level, I have to look at the constitution and see that the Constitution does not direct me in any way about abortion one way or the other. So it's very easy to say, well, I'm a federal candidate. Federal government has nothing to do with it. That goes back 10th Amendment down to the states. But we certainly don't need to fund it. And we don't need to. I mean, we shouldn't be funding Planned Parenthood anyway. So, you know, who cares about that? But we shouldn't be funding abortion at all. Now, individual states, you know, they've got their individual cultures. They can do their experimentation, see what works, what doesn't work. People can move from one place to another. And then that's up to them but I'm personally pro-life. Now, you said you, you wouldn't want to do anything with abortion as a senator on the federal level because it's not in the Constitution, but just on the philosophical level, do you think that looking at abortion and regulating abortion or, or what have you, do you think that is a, a, a hypothetical or a philosophical purview of government? Do you think that is a moral issue that government at, at any level should should be should be interfering with? No, I don't. I think it's more of a personal issue. And, and here's kind of where I fall on this. I don't have the right to tell you whether or not to eat high fructose corn syrup, which clearly harms you. Like I can't outlaw high fructose corn syrup and monosodium glutamate. So if I can't outlaw things that are clearly bad for you, and I don't have that decision-making control over your body, you're the only one that can make that decision over your body. I disagree with people that smoke and drink, but I can't stop them. I disagree with people that have abortions, but I can't stop them. But I'll tell you what I do is I talk to people and I offer them information, education and friendship and say, hey, you know, if you didn't eat so much high fructose corn syrup and down those Diet Cokes or whatever, you might not be 500 pounds, you might be 150. And hey, you know what, if you're going to have if you're if you're pregnant and you're scared, let me offer you support, whether it's moral support or resources or get you to a church or get you to somebody, some organization that can help you with the expenses of the birth and get an adoption. We have to change hearts and minds, not only for the cause of liberty, but for the cause of protecting the unborn. But, you know, the moment that I'm able to start telling a woman what she can do with her uterus, that's the moment when the government can turn to me and say, you know what, Lucy, I want you to uh, take these forced vaccinations and I want you to take this forced vitamin C and I and I want you to yeah, I'm going to force MSG down your throat. You've got to be really, really careful about things like that. Well, it goes back to that concept of uh, it's your soul. It's your body. It's yours to do with as you please. Uh, other than obviously, other than assault that body, the body of another in the, in the process of whatever you're doing. But I think that's a, a very interesting take on it. I mean, it's it's kind of similar to the take of, say, an Austin Peterson, where he's very personally pro-life, but as a libertarian, doesn't think there should be a, a sort of a government anti-abortion squad going around and, and interfering in, in that process. It's really more of a, a personal morality, you see, um, and something that should be affected through conversation, through setting, through leading of examples and that kind of thing. And there's probably no better example <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no person better to lead an example about how to get through a pregnancy than, than yourself. Since uh, you've, had, I don't know if you had ten full pregnancies, but you had yes. ten children. Are those are any of them twins, or is this all? Separate? Uh, no, no, seven girls, three wow. boys, no twins. I didn't even cheat by having them two at a time. <laughs> but you know what's important is that people, when they're looking at things, whether it's um, government policy or it's you know medical procedures, what I am all about is what all libertarians are about: transparency and fully informed consent. 
if our government were more transparent, we could see what they were doing, we could stop a lot of the nonsense. And if people knew with medical procedures, whether it's abortion that is linked to breast cancer later or to vaccines, which also have very negative consequences, if people actually knew because there was transparency, because they were fully informed, because there was no corruption, things would be very, very, very different. So let's get people the information that's true to let them make a better decision, but let's not be you know, jerks about it. You don't win friends and influence people by being you know, judgy and hateful. Let's go to people in friendship and offer them an alternative. I think that's a great, great philosophy to uh, go about things with. Lucy, let's move on to uh, this. Is another subject I think is always very difficult uh, as a libertarian to explain to people. And that's the subject of the environment. Now, obviously, none of us are in favor of, of destroying the environment uh, needlessly. At the same time, uh, every human action has some level of impact on the land around us. That's just that's just a fact. So what what is your view when it comes to tackling issues related to the environment through that libertarian lens? How would you look at that as a United States senator? Say if a company has a huge oil spill uh, off the coast of uh, you know off, off the coast of the uh, off the Gulf of Mexico, uh, how would you address things like that where companies um, may actually be involved in in, in pollution and, and the kind of thing that that should be addressed or at least that many people perceive should be addressed through government? Thanks for asking. Boy, the environment, we've all got to live here, right? And we've got to be got to have a good environment to pass on to our children. So this is of paramount importance to me. When we look at what's going on there, the first thing that we have to realize is the government, our government is the biggest polluter. Our government in collusion with corporations because of corruption, senators, Congress people, politicians everywhere, they're getting kickbacks or donations from companies that are polluters. And so that obviously skews the incentive and the incentive then becomes to write loopholes into the into the law that you can drive a truck through. I believe personally in strict liability for harm that is caused. So if uh, if a company pollutes, they should not only restore the land, water or air to where it was before the pollution, before the harm that was caused. But then we should also levy a fine against them that's so large that they should never ever want to pollute again. The cost of doing good business must be less and more profitable than the cost of doing bad business. And so once we get rid of the APA and we can operate on trespass and strict liability laws, we'll get rid of this, you know, hand, you know, one hand shaking the other nonsense that's going on right now. Sounds to me like you're you're pretty strong in the environment in that case. I mean, because even right now under our current system, if there's a if there's some kind of damage, the government is going to hold a company responsible for that damage. But often they're not going to fully hold that company responsible nope. for that damage. They're going to have certain limits set, uh, as they did with the, with the uh, the oil spill in the Gulf. They had limits set on the amount of liability the company could have. And you're kind of looking at it the other way. You're saying no, they should have an insane fine for and that. Really yes. does account for the actual damage done as opposed to just something for the public to consume saying, oh, look, they got fine. We feel better now. You want to really go after people that do do legitimate damage. Let's look at what's happening within the North Dakota pipeline. Why are the people scared? Because they know that their clean water is at risk and water is life. Why are they scared? Because there is a proven track record of failure of these very pipelines. One, and, and just two weeks ago, we had, what, 250,000 barrels an hour or something spilling out of Alabama. At the same time, they're protesting for clean water in North Dakota. So if the companies that had those pipeline spills were not only forced to completely clean it up, but then received such a huge fine, they probably wouldn't be looking at building a new pipeline. They'd want to do something different that was safer. Well, Lucy, you should certainly have a different take on on addressing some of these issues than, than a lot of other libertarians uh, out there do. And I, I think you're going to be a valuable voice going ahead here in this race in Indiana. I, I wish you the best of luck with it. I hope you can really you know, make some traction there. Hopefully you can win this race. So why don't we just imagine for a second a hypothetical Lucy Breton on um, the day after Election Day, you wake up to the news that you are. The very first, or maybe not only very first, maybe Alex <laughs> Merced, maybe Lily Tang Williams, maybe these other some of these other people will also be elected on that same day. We can only hope, but you'll be yes. one of the first libertarian senators ever elected. So what do you do on your very first day in office as a United States senator? What would your first order of business be? I'm going to get out a piece of pink paper and I'm going to write a slip that says you're fired and take it over to the Fed. End of the Fed. <laughs> you're That's going to you're march day. right in there and, and, and find Janet I Yellen. am. I am. I'm going to I'm going to put the smack down on her. I might have to even violate the AP to get her out of the building. It's like, hey, we're taking over. The people are back in control of the money. But seriously, the very first thing that I would fight for is the honest money system, 
because that is the evil that allows all the other evils to be funded. And so that really is that really is the core of the evil. And then after that, I would fight, obviously, for all of the things regarding self-ownership and, uh, and individual freedom. We have to protect the individual. If we don't protect the individual. You don't protect the group. All right, Lucy. Well, I wish you the best of luck in this Senate race. And I know that no matter what happens, you're going to continue to be out there as a strong voice for liberty and, and as an active uh, member of this libertarian movement. So I wish you the best of luck. Before I let you go, why don't you just let everyone know how they can find you once again, how they can find you on social media, how they can help your campaign and learn more about it and feel free to plug anything else you got going on. Uh, yes, thank you. LucyForSenate.com, LucyForSenate on Facebook. And please go to LucyForSenate.com forward slash donate. Give me a few bucks. I'll run some Facebook ads. That way I can put a dent to, you know, against the 8 million my, my opponents are spending against me. Lucy Breton, I wish you the best of luck. Take care. Thanks. All right, folks. I hope you enjoyed my discussion today with Miss Lucy Breton, Libertarian candidate for U.S. Senate. And who knows? It's possible that a week from now, she may be already the next senator-elect from Indiana. You never know how these things can play out. But regardless of how the elections play out, it's extremely important to have voices for liberty in the political arena. Even if Lucy doesn't win, as you heard, she's affecting the race by making the other two candidates address issues that are important to liberty-minded folks. And really, the, the progress that we're making on so many issues, whether it's the war on drugs, uh, whether it's the Second Amendment, whatever the issues may be, it's extremely important to have consistent, strong voices for liberty speaking up for the right things. Because that's the only way people are going to respond, and that's the only way politicians are going to, in turn, respond to them. It's that simple. And it's interesting because, you know, I got along with Lucy very well. She's a wonderful woman. Culturally, we are probably very different. You know, she is a religious woman. She has a belief in a God. I don't really share that belief. She has 10 children. <laughs> I don't have any children. I have two Huskies. That, that feels like 10 children to me. But the point being, our cultural differences are irrelevant when it comes to our political beliefs. Because as long as we share a belief in the individual rights, we share a belief that you own your own body. Well, then we share a similar philosophical bent when it comes to politics, and we can certainly join together on those things. Just like we can join together with progressives, with conservatives, with people of all ilks on issues where we overlap. Whether that's the war on drugs, as many libertarians will overlap with progressives. Whether that's the Second Amendment, as many libertarians will overlap with conservatives. I think this is this kind of stuff is way more important than sp supporting particular parties or what have you. Finding issues where we can all come together. I don't think there's any one party that purely represents a perfect ideology, including the Libertarian Party, sadly enough. And it seems almost inevitable that when we're talking about political parties, that just about any political party over time will drift away from pure philosophy in favor of pragmatism, in favor of advancing a political goal, whether it's growing that party or what have you. And the Libertarian Party is no different, but I think we can all agree that the, the choices being presented by Libertarians are extremely important, and I'm so glad that we have people like Lucy Breton out there representing them for us. Now, as you might have gathered from the interview, this was recorded uh, a few weeks ago before Lucy was, in fact, able to participate in the debate with her Republican and Democratic opponents. So if you go over to today's show notes, which are located at lionsofliberty.com slash 259, we'll post the link to that debate so you can check it out. And please give Lucy's campaign a look. Maybe you can help give her a final push in this last leg of the election cycle. Now, of course, coming up on this podcast this Friday, you'll have another edition of Felony Friday, John Odermatt's weekly look at the broken criminal justice system. And then next Monday, I am so excited. I, I can't keep a lid on this thing anymore, but I have an interview coming with one of my political idols. Not that I agree with him philosophically on everything, but this is somebody that really got me interested in politics many, many years ago before I had even heard about this guy, Ron Paul. And that is... Jesse the Body Ventura, former governor of Minnesota, conspiracy theorist, and also marijuana advocate, because we're going to be discussing his new book, Jesse Ventura's Marijuana Manifesto. So I am extremely excited to have Jesse Ventura, not only a political idol, a pro wrestling idol as well, as many of you know uh, that are longtime fans of the show. I am an unabashed, sometimes abashed, 
a fan of pro wrestling. And Jesse Ventura was one of the greatest, most hilarious wrestling commentators of all time. And he he turned that into a political career. And it's really a fascinating story from this guy. And I'm really excited to pick his brain on a lot of things, including the issue that he's currently extremely passionate about, and that is the legalization of marijuana. So please do tune in. Next Monday, the best way to make sure you don't miss that episode is to go and subscribe to this show on iTunes or on Stitcher Radio or whatever podcast app you happen to use. But whatever you you do use, I encourage you to please leave us a five-star rating and a great review, preferably on iTunes if you can. That is still by far the uh, largest platform for podcasts out there, Stitcher Radio. You can, of course, find all our programs on YouTube, youtube.com slash Lions of Liberty. Please leave us a rating. Please leave us a great review. Please share this program with your friends, because that's how we're going to keep this conversation going. Until next time, friends, live long and live free.